Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to the fourth lecture of this course, Gender and Literature. So as you know, uh, in the previous lecture, the third lecture, we started off with the Munshi Premchand short story called uh, The Chess Players, which is translated to English. Uh, the name in Hindi is Shatnush Kikilari. And we were looking at the short story, uh, and we also mentioned the film, which is made out of it, adapted out of it by Shruti Atrai. Uh, we looked at the short story as a classic case uh, of gender studies uh, in a certain historical condition. So as you know, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, that a short story uh, belongs to the period between 1847 uh, to 1856, which is right before the Sepoy Rebellion, when the company is taking over the kingdoms, the company is becoming increasingly powerful, uh, and there was a, a great resentment against the company's rule, against the company's uh, sort of uh, dominance. Uh, across India, as a result of which there will be the Sipai Rebellion in 1857. So this is a short story immediately before that, uh, and it, it, the setting is Lucknow. The setting is Awadh, you know, which is a kingdom ruled by the ruler Wazir Ali Shah. Uh, and we looked at how uh, different kinds of masculinity are in conflict with each other. So we have the Nawabi feudal, uh, hedonistic, pleasure-loving masculinity, which is contrasted, compared and contrasted with uh, the more pragmatic, productive. Uh, capitalist company masculinity embodied by the British and the British people working for the East India Company who are more military, more pragmatic, more rational, uh, more productive, uh, less hedonistic, more clinical, uh, sort of mercilessly uh, mercenary, right? So they're, they're complete capitalists as opposed to the more lyrical, poetic, metaphoric, hedonistic uh, masculinity uh, embodied by the Nawab. Now, more importantly, uh, is the condition of the woman we touched upon. Uh, in the previous lecture, where we said how the female gender, so you know, the, you know, the location of the female, the location of the woman in this kind of cultural context was quite tragic, was quite depressing, because the female they, they were located essentially. So if you're a married woman, uh, you know, married to someone like me or Mirza, the two protagonists in the short story, you are located in the confines of the house, uh, the interior of the house, in other words, so in one house one building would have several subspaces. So there will be this completely and purely private space which the woman would inhabit uh, from where uh, she would make food, give out food, give out pan, follow the instructions which are sent from the outside. And there will be this divan khana or the semi-urban space between the public space and the private space. That's the divan khana where the men sit, meet, play chess, discuss different things. Uh, which are quote-unquote outside the purview of the woman. But the, the fact of the matter is, as the story makes quite clear, and so does the film, uh, iconically as well as you know, visually as well as in terms of its content, the women are much more pragmatic, the women are much more intelligent than the men in this, kind, in this short story, in this, this narrative. And it's a tragedy that they don't have a real political, financial or cultural agency. They are completely imprisoned uh, in the interiority of the house as a result of which they can just be resentful, they can just be uh, manipulative, they can just, you know, be manipulated for very little petty ends. They don't really have any real political agency. So Mirza's wife, for instance, uh, the character played by uh, Shabana Hajmi in the film, uh, is, an, is an extremely intelligent character. She's resentful, she knows, she can see true things, uh, she's intuitive, uh, she obviously has much better administrative qualities than her husband or her husband's friend, I me. Mean, but then because of her biological birth as a woman, because of her biological location as a woman, uh, she cannot really enact any agency. She cannot really enact any authority. She doesn't have any authority uh, in this kind of a cultural context. So we just saw uh, at the end of the lecture, the previous lecture, uh, did that particular scene where uh, Mirza's wife is extremely resentful of her husband you know, spending enormous amount of time playing chess, you know, this endless games of chess which go on 
between a husband and a husband's friend meal. So whenever meal comes to the place, uh, the Diwan Khana is set up, the chess board is set up, and the two men indulge in an endless activity of playing chess, which the entire uh, activity of playing chess, as you know, becomes very, it becomes very quickly a very convenient and complex metaphor for inaction, inertia, uh, you know, indulgence, absorption, disconnect from reality. Because these are men who are constantly thinking of the maneuvers and the different battle tactics on the chess board with little knowledge, with little idea of the real battle tactics, with little idea of the real maneuvers they're, they're required to enact in a changing political climate around them. They don't have no idea of the changing political climate. They have no idea of the fact that the company is consuming the kingdom. They have no idea of the fact that the company is sort of lent enormous amount of money and now the Nawab is in great debt and bankrupt and can't pay back the loans as a result of which the companies gradually and seamlessly uh, will take over the kingdom in uh, very, very imminently. They have absolutely no knowledge of this uh, real situation because they're completely absorbed in this game of chess. And that is what defines their gender identity. That is what defines, that's the sole determinant of their gender identity. Uh, the endless games of chess that they play with each other. Uh, and the condition of the woman, as I just mentioned, is extremely tragic. They are sort of imprisoned in the interiority. They are resentful of this game of chess. Uh, but they don't have any real action. They don't have any real agency as a result of which they can't act. They can't act out their anger, except with very futile words and rhetoric and rage. Uh, only on one occasion does Mirza's wife actually come or enter the Divan Khana, a space where she's not supposed to enter uh, because of her biological identity, her gendered identity. But she does enter because she can't take it anymore that her husband uh, sort of completely is absorbed in his game of chess. And she comes in and unsettles the chessboard and then goes away. And that becomes an act of rebellion. That's almost an act of sacrilege. Uh, you know, given the gender condition of the time. The woman was not allowed to enter the Divan Khana, but she does enter the Divan Khana because she's completely and absolutely and extremely resentful of her husband's uh, endless activity in, game, in, in playing chess. Uh, so that particular scene we'll study in some detail. Uh, that scene where she enters the Divan Khana, unsettles the chess pieces and goes away uh, in a mad fury. Uh, you know, that becomes an act of rebellion. But the point is, this is all the rebellion that a woman can do and this is so tragic that the woman uh, someone so intelligent and intuitive and someone so rational and pragmatic as Mirza's wife the only rebellion the biggest rebellion that she can do is enter the divan khana of her own house and unsettle some chess pieces and that goes to show the crisis of agency faced by the woman that the woman suffered from they did not have any real agency they could not step out of the house they could not have any money, they could not own any property, they could not have any real political privilege. Despite their intelligence, despite their intuitive knowledge, despite uh, their administrative abilities, they were completely imprisoned and chained in the gendered locations. So uh, the previous slide and the last slide which I played um, you know, in, in the last lecture uh, sort of you know, really emphasized the point, really underlined the point that Mirza's wife was completely unhappy with the entire situation, the fact that she was completely imprisoned in her own uh, interiority of her house, whereas her husband played endless games of chess with another man uh, on, uh, in the Divan Khana, where she's not allowed to enter. And all that she could do is express a resentment in rhetoric to her husband, because you know, she couldn't really do anything, because she didn't, didn't really have any real agency. She had no money, no political power, no social privilege. Her entire identity was you know, her being Mirza's wife, and that was it. Really. So she was just called Begum. We don't even know her name. right? We never got to know the names of any other woman uh, in the short story. And that is a very clear indication of the agency lessness. They don't have names. They're someone's wives. They're someone's Begum. And all they can do is be resentful rhetorically. They, they, they can just say, they can express their resentment in words. And all the, that's all they can do. They can't act out. They can't really act out their will. They can't really act out their intentions. They can't really act out their emotions, except through very futile words, which the husbands uh, will find very convenient to brush aside. Okay? So, if you look at, I'm going to play a slide now. It appears on the screen now. So, uh, this is a section where the Begum, the wife of Mirza, is complaining of a massive headache. So she's saying that, you know, I'm suffering from this massive headache and she sends a servant to Mirza asking him to go to the doctor, uh, you know, the Hakim and get some medicine for her because she's suffering from this massive headache uh, and she's in pain, uh, she's suffering. But of course the husband is completely oblivious to it. Um, he couldn't care less about the wife 
and all that he's absorbed in, in his game of chess with another man called me. So uh, he sends a servant back saying that you know he, he can't be bothered to go out and get medicine for a while because you know, uh, he is in a very uh, sort of tactical situation. He's a very in a very sensitive situation now not in, in a real situation, not in, in a real battlefield, but obviously in this unreal battlefield of this chess game. So the entire idea that Prim Chan wants to communicate to us, or Ray wants to communicate to us, convey to us uh, through this film, the medium of the film, is the fact that these are men uh, who are completely absorbed in unreal activities of leisure. So they have no idea of the reality of the situation, about the political reality, about the economic reality, about the domestic reality. They don't even know the wives, they don't even connect to the wives, they couldn't even be bothered to the wives. The wives are just commodities uh, uh, who produce food for them and serve them as they play these endless games of chess. So this is indeed a very tragic situation for the woman. This is indeed a very sad situation for the woman where all that she is reduced to is a machine producing food. Uh, she has no agency, she has no presence. Uh, her, I mean, forget about uh, female agency. She has no human presence uh, apart from being uh, somewhere inside the house, someone inside the house, something inside the house preparing food and palm for Mirza and me. And that goes to show again, and I spent a good deal of time in the last lecture talking about the relationship between gender and space. So her location in the interior section of the house is quite telling because that is reflective of the situation of the woman who was not allowed to step out, who was not allowed to uh, sort of step out of the interiority of the house and take up a public position or even a semi-public position. So because remember, uh, I have mentioned the scene already and I will play it up. Uh, I will sort of talk about it in great details when I come to it really in the short story. Uh, the, the, the moment when Mirza's wife actually enters the Divan Khana, she is uh, for all her rage, for all her anger and resentment against her husband and, uh, and, and his friend and his game of chess that they play, she is hesitant. She suffers from a moment of hesitance, you know, uh, you know, ambivalence. So she is someone, uh, you know, who is very, very assertive and uh, someone who is very intelligent and someone obviously who wants to make a presence felt, but because she is uh, forbidden from entering the Diwan Khana uh, and she's grown up in that kind of value system which uh, forbids women from entering the Diwan Khana on a semi-public space. She suffers from some kind of a crisis uh, for a moment when she's about to enter the Diwan Khana and unsettle uh, the chessboard uh, for her husband. Right? So despite her age, uh, you know, she is still hesitant. She is still someone uh, who doesn't quite know whether this is the right thing to do or, the, or not the right thing to do. But she ends up doing it. She ends up unsettling the board. She ends up destroying the chess game for them. And then she runs away uh, in fury. Now, uh, this is a section where she's asking her husband to go out uh, and get some medicine for a headache. Uh, and she had sent the servant to the, to, to the husband, uh, who very conveniently sent him back, saying he's busy now and can't go now. Uh, you know, and you know, he's asking her to wait essentially, which goes to show obviously that his priorities are more inclined towards unreality, towards indulgence, uh, towards indolence, and he's much happier playing chess with another man than taking care of his domestic duties. Forget about, let alone political duties or financial duties, because you don't have to worry about those things. Uh, these are Jagadars, as I mentioned. These are uh, you know, landowners in a very feudal economy uh, who, gets, who get money from somewhere. The money comes in from somewhere. Some poor farmer produces something uh, and a certain percentage of that produce comes to them by default. So they don't, don't, don't really have to worry about uh, earning for a living or working for a living. Right? So this is what makes them so indolent and lazy and hedonistic. So this section, uh, which will appear on your screen uh, in a second, and it does now. Uh, so when Mirza Sahib went in, so th this is after a lot of requests, and he finally gets in and talks to his wife, because the wife is obviously enraged uh, and tells him that, uh, and sends a servant with a message that if Mirza doesn't go out to get, to get the medicine for her, she will go out herself, and this is unthinkable. Uh, the wife of the house stepping out on the road to get her own medicine will be a sacrilege, a spectacular sacrilege. So Mirza has to go in at that point. When Mirza Sahib went in, the Begum changed her tactics and said, groaning with pain, you love this wretched game so much that you don't even care if I'm dying. What kind of a man are you? So this question uh, is obviously a very telling question. What kind of a man are you? So you know, this question which appears on the screen now, and I'm highlighting it when it's red dot away. Yeah? What kind of a man are you? Uh, obviously is a question about the masculinity of these people. 
So they don't really have any masculinity. They don't really have military masculinity, rational masculinity. All they indulge in is a very hedonistic kind of lifestyle, which is completely oblivious to the domestic duties, to the financial duties, to the political duties. And these are courtiers. They're supposed to be uh, you know, responsible uh, to the kingdom, to the well-being of the kingdom. But of course, this is a situation which is completely decadent. So no one's responsible for anything. And everyone's absorbed absolutely uh, in leisurely activities. So the question, what kind of a man are you? Uh, which comes from a woman uh, is a very tragic question because you know she is someone who's suffering not just from an immediate headache but from her lack from a complete uh, crisis of agency and lack of care I mean she's not really cared about as a human being she's a commodity she's a machine producing food and selling the food on farm uh, to the men who play chess endlessly in a semi-public space in the house right so Mirza replied uh, what could I do? Mir Sahib wouldn't let me go. It was so hard to come, which is an absolute, absolute lie. If you, if you read the entire short story, you find that Mir actually asks him to go and take care of his wife. Mirza says, oh, let her, uh, you know, this is just a tactic for her to, to ask me to come in and destroy her game, so I might as well carry on with the game. And he went in much later uh, when, the, when, the, when the servant came and told her that, you know, if you don't come in, the Begum will step out of the house and go to the Divan Khana, the, 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 the Hakim herself. And at this point, at that point, he was forced to go. But obviously, he's lying over here. So he says, what could I do? Mir Sahib wouldn't let me go. It's so hard to come. Does he think all are as idle as he? Does he have any children? Or has he cleaned them up? He's such an addict. Whenever he comes, I'm forced to play. Now, the reference to the children is very interesting because both these men uh, are childless men. There's no mention of any child. Uh, in, 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 the, in the story. And there is a child who appears in the film, the end of the film, who, do, who doesn't appear uh, in the end of the short story, but there's a little boy who appears in the end of the film and he's a very symbolic presence. And we'll talk about that uh, towards the end of this lecture. But interestingly, and appropriately enough and symbolically, these two men, Mir and Mirza, they don't happen to have any children. So even that is a symbol of their, you know, and it's a continuation of the unproductivity we talk about. So even as biological men, even as biological males, they are unproductive. They don't have any children. So they're, they're, they're decadent in that sense. They haven't adopted any children. They don't have any children. They don't, there's no reference. There's no mention of any subsequent generation of the line. So this is literally a line, a lineage, a culture, a narrative which is coming to an end, which will die where these three men die. And they do die at the end of the short story. Uh, and they, they, they do symbolically die at the end of the film. Uh, we'll discuss the ends in some details uh, as we move on in this lecture. But the reference, the question that Mirza's wife has from, uh, you know, uh, for him, that does he have any children or has he cleaned them up? And the reference uh, and the response of Mirza obviously is uh, a very manipulative response where he says, oh, uh, he's such an addict and I'm forced to play with him, which is again a complete lie because we know very well that the two men are very happily, they play chess with each other very, very happily. Uh, this is what they want to do, but they transfer the blame to each other uh, to make themselves look cleaner, to make you know, you know, himself more clean uh, and less guilty of it. But obviously, this is being manipulated. This is manipulative masculinity. This is not really uh, assertive, powerful, uh, agentic masculinity. You know, it's manipulative masculinity. So this is, this is reflective of the fact that even the hegemonic masculinity of this time, so these are rich, wealthy landowners. So they are supposedly or technically hegemonic, right? Because of the financial location, because of the cultural location, these are you know, uh, high class people, these are people with money, uh, with property, with wealth, with certain degree of agency. But even there, even then, uh, these people, they are forced to be manipulated. They are manipulative, they are lying, they have to lie. So which goes to show that there is no real hegemonic masculinity left in this kind of a cultural situation. And it's, you know, it's just waiting to be taken over, it's just waiting to be replaced. This kind of hegemonic masculinity is decadent, it's dying, and it's waiting to be replaced by uh, a more capitalist, a more pragmatic, a more utilitarian, a more uh, mercilessly mercenary kind of masculinity, which is embodied by the East India Company, uh, the white people working for the East India Company, who come in and take over the kingdom as if it's a, it's a piece of cake. It's, you know, it's really a cakewalk for them, just march in and take over the kingdom without any resistance on the part of the Nawab or the military. Right? So. Uh, and the question then she asks subsequently to Mirza is, why don't you drive him away? And the response is, he is my equal in age and two places higher in rank. I have to oblige him. 
So again, this goes to show it's a very, very feudal culture. It's a culture which is completely hierarchical, right? It's a culture which thrives on hierarchy. So, you know, someone is above you in rank, someone is below you in rank. And mind you, he says two places higher in rank. So, you know, the reference is to two places higher in rank. And this is interesting because it's completely quantifiable. The hierarchy is not something which is an abstract hierarchy. It's a completely material, quantifiable hierarchy. So you know exactly who belongs to which place. So I'm, you know, two places beneath someone. I'm two places above someone. So I can quantify it. It's a very defined, fixed, uh, quantifiable kind of hierarchy because it's a very feudal system, right? And that's the kind of feudal system which produces this kind of masculinity, this leisurely, hedonistic, lazy, indolent kind of masculinity, and which makes the condition of the woman even worse because the women uh, don't, don't, don't really have any agency. You know, all they can do is be someone's wife. And even then, you know, as someone's wife, they hardly have any agency inside their own house. They can't enter certain sections of the house. They're confined to certain sections of the house. And all they can do is be resentful uh, or be manipulative uh, in order to get some kind of agency. They don't really have any real agency. They don't have any financial, cultural, political agency. And, you know, just to get a little bit of agency inside their own house, they need to be resentful and manipulative and nagging and all the rest of it, right? Which obviously goes to show the very sad condition of the woman at this time. The men with agency are unproductive. They're biologically unproductive, they're economically unproductive, they're culturally unproductive. So they are decaying away. These are dying men. These are older men. So these are, these are men who are decaying away with time by playing endless games of chess by completely busying themselves with complicated maneuvers on an unreal battleground with, with no knowledge whatsoever of any real battleground, of any real economic situation, of any real political situation. That knowledge is, I mean, they, they don't need to have that knowledge. They're not bothered about that knowledge. Whereas this is a time which is a very um, sort of a very sensitive, complex time when everything is changing. The economy is changing, the army is changing, the language is changing, uh, the political agency is changing. There will be a very, very quick change, a very imminent change coming up when the Nawab is going to disappear and the, and, and the company is going to take over and, and uh, rule our world. But and everyone knows about it and this is about to happen. It's imminent, it's absolutely unavoidable. But these are men who live in denial, who live in ignorance. So the ignorance becomes something like a, a you know, hedonistic strategy. It's a strategy which they use uh, to completely uh, cocoon themselves from the reality of a situation, right? So they, all they can do, I mean, they, they strategically absorb themselves completely and absolutely in this game of chess, which they play endlessly. Uh, and obviously, the woman over here, they're completely deprived of agency, deprived of care, deprived of any love, deprived of any kind of human concern. So they are complete commodities, right? They're commodities uh, out there to please the men as and when they want pleasure. Right? It could be gastronomic pleasure, it could be sexual pleasure, it could be any kind of pleasure. The women have no choice in terms of where they want to be, what they want to do. And this particular short story makes it completely clear of this agency-less situation of the woman. And like I said at the beginning of this uh, short story in the previous lecture, we need to be mindful, absolutely mindful and sensitive to the situation, to the context that, that produces this short story. This is 1847, uh, somewhere between 1847 and 1856, uh, possibly around 1856 because the Nawab's rule is about to come to an end. And historical was it Alisha, as we know, ruled from 1847 to 1856. So this might be 1856, the last year of the rule of the Nawab, because the company is about to come in and take over the kingdom uh, like a cakewalk. Right. So, uh, so if you come back to this uh, slide, uh, so when Mirza said that me is his equal in age and two places higher in rank, I have to oblige him. The wife's response is, "Okay, then I shall drive him away. What if he's offended?" Does it feed us? Oh, hurry up, go and pick up the chessboard and tell me, Sahib, the Mirza Sahib won't play anymore. Tell him to go home. For God's sake, don't do anything of that kind. Would you have me humiliate? Oh, hurry up, stop, don't go. Why don't you let her go? Anyone who stops her will drink my blood. All right, you stopped her. Let me see how you stop me. Now, the point is, what is completely clear, if you look at this section over here, uh, you know, Mirza uh, is completely emasculated. Now, there the are two readings that he can do with this. I mean, Mirza obviously wants the chess games to continue. Now, he's lying to his wife, telling her that I am obliged to play with me because me is my superior and he wants to play chess, so I play chess against my will, which is a complete lie. 
because he is very happy to play chess. He wants to play chess as much as me does, but he's scared to tell that to his wife. Uh, again, uh, because the wife will be offended and she'll be angry uh, and will probably lambast her uh, rhetorically, etc. Now, that this entire situation is obviously funny uh, in a dark, humorous kind of a way, but it's also quite sad at various levels. The most immediate level, obviously, is a very sad situation of the woman. Now, all that she wants, all that she claims, and look at a stake over here. What does she want over here? What does the woman want over here? The woman wants her husband not to play chess anymore and spend some time with her. Now, she doesn't dare want any financial agency. She doesn't dare want any uh, political agency. Those are completely uh, fantastic desires. I mean, those will never come, will never happen. Uh, so, uh, she wouldn't dream of dreaming those things. Now, all that she does want, all that she does desire is some kind of a domestic conjugal relationship with her husband. That's all she wants. And she has to fight for it. She has to sort of struggle for it. She has to be manipulative. She has to be resentful. She has to be rhetorical. She has to sort of hammer whom the point and again all this together point at the very very helpless situation of the woman now a woman like you know the Begum of Mirza a woman of her intelligence her authority her presence of mind her intuition uh, her common sense uh, her personality would normally should morally not marry someone like Mirza but of course this is a time when the only professions uh, you know, available for women were either to become someone's wives or to become courtesans in someone's court or prostitutes or work in very, very menial conditions. So marrying someone becomes a, an option of life uh, for this woman. There's no job. I mean, forget about job. There's nothing that a woman has at this point of time in history. It's a completely feudal, hierarchical, patriarchal system. And it's a system which perpetuates itself. And this kind of a, you know, it's, it's a patriarchy which perpetuates itself completely through its hierarchy, through its cultural accords, through its rituals. So the woman has absolutely no agency whatsoever outside her house. So all that Mirza's wife wants to do is a very modest desire that she wants some kind of a conjugal closeness with her husband. And even that is denied to her. Even that is something she doesn't have. So she has to be uh, in a manipulative, resentful, uh, tactical, in order to have some kind of a conjugal closeness with her legally married husband. Right? Now, as she says at this point, if you come to the slide, which will appear in the screen in a second, it does now. So she says, if you can't do it, I shall go and drive him away. So again, if you go back to the previous slide that I, sh I showed you. So again, this, this seems to suggest that she has more masculinity than a husband, despite being biologically female. So she is more assertive. She is more authoritative. She is someone with more of a presence of mind. She is someone who can speak her mind. She is someone who can be authoritative, who can be assertive in her own right. right? Now that is something that is completely lacking in the husband. The husband is very happy to be, you know, uh, personality-less. The uh, husband is very happy uh, to be indolent and indulgent and lazy and futile and all the rest of it. She, he's completely disconnected from any reality of any responsibility whatsoever. Whereas she wants to take up a responsibility. She wants to make her presence felt through her action, through her words, etc. So she threatens the husband away, um, saying that, you know, if you don't do it, I shall drive him away. What if he's offended? Does it feed us? So the question, this is obviously a very, very interesting question because uh, it seems to break away from the feudal mindset. That just because someone is higher than us in rank doesn't mean we have to satisfy the person endlessly. I mean, we don't, we, we don't get fed by him, right? We don't, we don't owe him anything. We don't owe him any money. So we are what we are. So there seems to be a, some kind of a suggestion of individuality which is completely lacking in the husband, right? The husband is very happy to be feudal. The husband's rhetoric is very feudal. Her, his imagination is very feudal. His worldview is very feudal. He will not dare offend someone who is higher than him in rank by two steps, right? And again, as I say, it's completely quantifiable in terms of the step, in terms of the hierarchy. He will not do it. But the wife is very happy to do it because as she says, they don't owe him anything. They don't owe me anything. Right? So me, despite being higher than them in rank by two steps, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it's not their law. He doesn't you know, give them money. He doesn't really take care of them. So she says, she thinks that she's perfectly within her rights to go and ask me to go away. And the reason why I played this section uh, in some details before you is to again uh, sort of map out the difference between the different gendered identities the way up. 
So the woman, the biological woman, seems to be more authoritative, seems to be more assertive, seems to speak her mind, seems to be more intelligent. I mean, she's clearly more intelligent. She's clearly got more administrative duties and skills than a husband. But the husband has real agency because of his biological birth, because of his biological location. But despite that, his gendered location is quite uh, compromising, uh, is quite unimpressive. And that is reflective of the gendered location in the kingdom of Aoud at that point of time, the kingdom in the city of Lucknow, uh, it is completely emasculated, right? The, the, it's politically emasculated, it's militarily emasculated, it's economically emasculated. And this emasculation is something which is caused by indulgence, narcissism, absorption, uh, you know, complete absorption in hedonistic pleasure, uh, and a certain degree of intoxication as well, intoxication with pleasure. Right? So this is an emasculation which happens at various levels. And obviously, the British just come in, the company comes in with its very capitalist, mercenary, pragmatic, productive, goal-oriented kind of masculinity and takes over the kingdom without any resistance whatsoever. But the point that I'm trying to make, and the point that the story seems to suggest in various uh, sections, is that a woman, they seem to have more administrative power. The woman, they seem to have more intuitive intelligence, more pragmatic intelligence. They don't want to be wasted. They don't want to be decadent, right? And this refusal to be decadent uh, is something which makes them more assertive, something which makes them more impressive. Right? But of course, as I keep saying, uh, and if you, if you, you have to be aware of the gendered condition of the times, the condition of gender, the, the role of the woman at the time, the condition of the woman at the time, it was absolutely impossible for the woman to actually enact any kind of agency in any real situation, in any political situation, in any social situation. So all that she can do, Mrs. White, is to enact some kind of an agency, pseudo-agency, you can call it, inside her own domestic space. So in order to claim her role, in order to claim her location, in order to claim her situatedness uh, inside her own house, she is forced to be manipulative, she is forced to be resentful, she is forced to be, uh, you know, absolutely neurotic, right? And she's completely neurotic with rage, she's so shivering with rage, she wants conjugal relationship with her husband, which is denied to her. Right? And all because of this absolute absorption in this game of chess. That is, two men play with each other. Right? Okay. Now, this is a section that is quite possibly a really important section in the short, short story. And again, this is uh, the act of a uh, quote unquote sacrilege that a woman does. Right? It's something of, it's almost like a gender blasphemy. I mean, she does something she's not allowed to do as a woman. And what does she do? Saying this, the Begum Sahiba moved towards the Divan Khanam. So this is a very symbolic move, moving towards the Divan Khanam. Because remember, the Divan Khanam is an all-male space. It is what we call in masculinity studies, and we will come to that term later, especially when we look at George Orwell's uh, essay, Shooting an Elephant, after this lecture. It's an example of a homosocial space, right? It's a homosocial space for men. Right? It's a kind of social space where you meet other men, uh, enact different rituals with other men, eat pan, smoke cigarettes, smoke hookah, play games such as, uh, discuss politics. It's a space which is completely homogeneously male, and hence is homosocially male. It's a social space which is homogeneous. There is no presence of the other gender. There is no presence of the woman uh, in this kind of space. So the divan kana, when she is moving towards the divan kana, is a symbolic act of subversion. So subversion is rebellion, right? So she is entering a gendered space, a, a, a space which belongs to the other gender. So as a woman, this is an act of rebellion. This is an act of subversion. She is challenging certain normative categories of speciality, right? So uh, we, we keep talking about the relationship between space and gender. So over here, this Divan Kana is obviously a very, very uh, male space, a homosocially male space. And she's about to enter that space, and that becomes symbolically and really an act of subversion. Okay? So we need to be careful, we need to be aware of the, uh, the significance of this particular section in the short story, the emotional significance, the existential significance, and most importantly, the subversive significance. Right? It's so significantly subversive uh, as an act, as a movement. Right? So coming back to the section, so, you know, we, we just saw how it, she moves towards the Divankana and what happened subsequently. So Mirza's face turned pale. He began to plead with her, for God's sake, in the name of Hazrat Hussain, you would see me dead if you went there. 
but the Begum was in no, in no mood to listen. She walked out to the Divan Khanam, but she couldn't get, go in in the presence of a stranger. Again, I want you to notice this section. She couldn't go in in the presence of a stranger. Why so? Because she is uh, ideologically uh, ingrained in that culture. So she, she sort of grew up in that value system which forbids them into going into a male space in the presence of another male apart from a husband. So that's something which she should not do, something which is forbidden to her, something which is sort of not allowed to the woman, and something which will be completely an act of not just subversion but you know, sacrilege if she does it. So she is hesitant. She, she doesn't know whether or not she should go in. She looked inside, but there was no one there. Mir Sahib had displaced a few pieces on the board and had gone out for a stroll to show his innocence. Then what? The Begum went inside and overturned the chessboard, threw down some chess men on the floor and some others through the door and closed the door from inside. Mir Sahib saw the chess men being thrown out and heard the sound of bangles and the, sound being, and the door being locked. Realizing that the Begum was inflamed, he slinked away. Now, this is a really, really, uh, it's sort of pregnant with readings. I mean, there are so many readings you can do uh, from a perspective of gender studies. Now, first of all, let us look at the movements over here. She walked up to the Divan Khana. Again, look, notice the language. She's like dressing up. She's manning up. She's becoming more masculine. She's becoming someone she's not. It's an act of elevation. She walks up to the Divan Khana. Now, what happens inside the Divan Khana? If you look at the you know, passage again, so she walks up to the Divan Khana, but then she has a moment's hesitation because there is a stranger. She thinks there is a stranger. But what has me done uh, in the meanwhile? So Meet Sahib had displaced a few pieces on the board. So she, he had cheated. So these are men who are very, very petty. These are men who cheat. These are men who lie. These are men who ma are manipulated. In other words, uh, being manipulated, lying, cheating. So these uh, are not becoming of dominant, martial, military, the very stereotypical idea of dominant masculinity. They don't fit in into that kind of a frame. So these are men who are petty men, who are hollow men, who are weak men, who are unproductive men. So the, he had displaced a few pieces on the boat just to make his position stronger. And in order to prove his innocence, he had walked away. Uh, just so if Mirza came back, uh, he would not see me there. And so he could not possibly suspect him of doing anything underhand. But he had done something underhand already. He had displaced the, a few chess pieces on the board and gone away. Now, interestingly, what I want you to see is when me, uh, when, the, when the description is on me, the reference is to chess pieces on the board. And then the Begum went inside and overturned the chessboard. This is symbolically an act of subversion. It's a female entering the male space and turning everything upside down, overturning the chessboard. So chessboard obviously is a metaphor for this male activity uh, of indulgence, pleasure, uh, you know, homosociality, etc. That is symbolically overturned by the woman, which is obviously an act of symbolic subversion and also an act of real subversion. She really does that. Now, interestingly, if you look at the subsequent description, threw down some chess men on the floor. Now, mind you, it doesn't say chess pieces. It says chess men. And this is a very good example of uh, literary reading, a good training and literary reading. So, you know, what it seems to suggest, and obviously a good work of literature will not tell you everything. It will show you certain things and you, it's your job uh, to interpret it, to unpack what is between the lines. What is between the lines over here is quite clear. She has got in, she walked up uh, to the Divan Khana, sort of act of manning up. Uh, she went in when there was no one inside and she overturned the chessboard, which is obviously a symbolic act of subversion. More importantly, she threw down the chess men on the floor. So the men are on the floor. She had overturned the chess men on the floor. And some others threw the door and closed the door from inside. Now, me saw the chess men being thrown out. So, symbolically, the men are being thrown out. The chess men being thrown out of the chessboard is symbolic of the men being thrown out of the Divan Khana by the woman. And heard the sound of bangles and the door being locked. So, if you look at the sounds over here, it's a female sound, the female sound dominating the entire acoustic system uh, in that room at that moment, moment of time. So she walks in, uh, you know, flings the chessboard, uh, overturns the chessboard, flings the chess men on the floor, and me hears the chess men being flung on the floor. And additionally, 
he hears the sound of bangles, which is obviously symbolic, you know, indicating the fact that a woman had come in. A woman had come in and done this. So the woman walks into the male space, overturns everything, and the sound of bangles is representative or indicative or suggestive of her presence, her powerful presence in the room, and then she walks away. Now again, notice uh, the use of verbs away. Uh, being, you know, she, she walks away, close the door from inside. Mid Sahib saw the chessmen being thrown and heard the sound of bangles and a door being locked. Again, very clinical movements. The door was locked. The chessmen are flung. The chessboard is overturned. So there's a clinical precision and you know, it's all been done, right? There's no half measures about it. It's all being done in a very assertive, authoritative kind of a way. Now, the last bit of the passage is important. So if you go back to it, realizing that the Begum was inflamed, he slinked away. Again, look at the movement, slinked away. Now, who slinks away or what slinks away? So slinking away is indicative of a spineless movement. There's a, there's a reptilian quality to it, right? A snake slinks away, a reptile had slung away, you said, right? So someone slinking away is indicative of, uh, you know, someone being spineless, someone being scared, someone being, you know, uh, obviously without any authority, someone essentially running away in fear. Right? If you contrast slinking away with uh, the, the Begums walking up at the beginning, you would notice the differences. And again, this will go back to the slide that I played a little while earlier. Uh, so the real masculine gender, uh, the real masculinity is enacted by the woman, who unfortunately has no real agency. So she can't uh, you know, really do anything after a certain point. So all that she can do is uh, enter her own house, uh, enter a room inside her own house and enact an act of subversion uh, which is throwing away the chessboard, uh, upturning the chessboard and throwing away the chess pieces and then going away. She, doesn't, she does not have a real political agency. But the fact remains she has more of a masculinity presence than the real biological men who are essentially useless, uh, you know, unproductive and who are essentially cowards. They slink away in fear whenever they hear any kind of subversion coming at them. So this particular passage and the reason why I played it is obviously, you know, I wanted to give you a flavor of the way language can be used, uh, space and language can be used together to indicate certain kind of gender activities. So how space and language can collude together, can come together to represent certain kind of gendered activities, to represent certain kind of gendered roles. So the gendered role enacted by the woman over here is that of you know, someone very masculine and authoritative and assertive. She comes in, walks up to the divan khana, uh, upturns the chessboard, uh, flings away the chess men on the floor. Again, the use of the word chess men, as I mentioned, is very, very suggestive and symbolic. Uh, it's not chess pieces, but chess men, because the chess men, uh, throwing away the chess men on the floor is, you know, symbolically, it accentuates the act of subversion. It underlines the subversion that she is doing as a woman uh, to these men, right? And obviously, that makes it even more complex uh, uh, from a gender studies perspective. So this is quite possibly the most uh, dramatic section uh, in the whole story. And obviously, it's very, very useful for us uh, looking at the story from a perspective of gender studies. How movements, language, space, all this uh, seemingly innocuous, all these seemingly non-political things can actually be, are really indeed are quite discursive and political, right? So walking up to the Divan Khana, slinking away from the Divan Khana. So essentially, um, you know, the men are emasculated. The biological men are completely emasculated by the presence of this assertive, authoritative woman uh, who comes in uh, resentful uh, and enacts an act of subversion uh, because of her anger and she's angry because uh, she's angry with the men because they, do, they, do, they completely deny her any kind of agency. I mean, she doesn't want political agency, she, do, she doesn't want financial agency. All she wants is some kind of a normal conjugal relationship with her husband. Even that is denied to her by the presence of these men, the other men, me who comes in uh, and because of this ritual of game, playing the game of chess endlessly. So this section uh, it's something I want you to read carefully, reread carefully, uh, having, you know, hopefully have a quite uh, a good idea about the gendered politics and performativity and embodiment and agency which are operative uh, in this entire section. So this entire section, uh, you know, can be read as an excellent example of embodiment. 
change in embodiment. So there's a, there's a very clear and palpable change and visible change in embodiment in the woman. The biological woman, uh, she mans up to a great extent. She walks up to a place where she's not allowed to go in. She overturns the chessboard. She flings the chessman on the floor and then she walks away, locking the door. So the entire act, the entire movement is a movement of precision, authority, uh, assertion uh, and a movement of a very powerful presence. Now contrast that to the very weak, meek and emasculated presence of the men who essentially slink away. So one man, her husband, uh, pleads her not to go, right? Uh, tells him, her uh, that in, if you go, for God's sake, you'll see my dead face. Again, that kind of rhetoric is stereotypically uh, ascribed to women. That if you go somewhere, you see my dead face, please don't go, I'm pleading you not to go. So that kind of plea rhetoric is given to the man over here. Whereas the woman actually marches up to the Divan Khana, uh, goes in there very assertively, uh, overturns the chessboard, flings the chessmen away and walks away, locking the door. So the movement, the embodied movement over here is extremely important. So again, look at the way in which all the things we've been talking about for the last two and a half, three lectures now, uh, the relationship between space, embodiment, agency, performativity, how these come together. So this is quite performative because what she does, uh, Mirza's wife, through the act of rebellion, through the act of subversion by marching into the room, uh, overturning the chessboard, flinging the chessmen on the floor, she does a performative act which arouses an effect, an effect of awe and obviously and immediately an effect of fear. So much so that me, the man, the biological man has to slink away in fear. He can't face her. He can't go up to her, he can't confront her. He sees it happening from a distance and he runs away uh, spinelessly, slinking away in fear, terrified, completely terrified, right? So again, this is performativity, this is embodiment, this is agency and this is space. Uh, how a space is remapped. So initially, uh, originally and uh, ontologically, this is a male space. This is a space inhabited by men, men alone. Right? This, is, this is a space where men come, discuss, smoke hookah, uh, eat pan, chew pan, uh, you know, discuss politics, discuss different kinds of quote unquote serious things uh, and in this case uh, they end up playing chess all the time in this room. But importantly, uh, this is a space, discursively speaking, this is a space where women are not allowed to enter. Right? This is a divan khana. When an act of rebellion happens, the space is remapped. The woman enters the space uh, and essentially castrates the men essentially emasculates the men. The men are essentially emasculated. So this idea of slinking away, there's a reptilian quality, he's not walking away in a manly way. Uh, it's a very limp, reptilian, emasculated, deflated kind of a movement, which is caused by the very powerful presence of the woman in this particular setting. So this is a, quite possibly the most important section of the short story in terms of the relationship and embodiment, agency, space especially if looking at the short story from the perspective of gender studies. Okay? So hopefully you know, you, you, you know the importance and significance of this situation. Right. Okay, so uh, we move on uh, and we will sort of skip towards the end very, very quickly. We find the political situation on the kingdom. So the two men, uh, you know, they, they are kicked out of the house, uh, Samirza's house. So for a period of time, they go to Mead's house uh, and start playing chess there. But various complications happen even in Mead's house. Uh, so a soldier comes uh, and asks for Mead, uh, and Mead is terrified. And the two men, they decide to run away. They decide to, you know, slink away again and play chess on the margins of the kingdom beside a river. But you know, before we come to that. This is an example, this is a situation which is happening in, 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 a, in, a, in a political situation, the political uh, condition of the kingdom. So on the other side, the political situation of the kingdom was deteriorating every day. The company's forces were advancing upon Lucknow. The city was in a turmoil. People were fleeing to the villages with their families. But our two players were unconcerned. So again, this complete disconnect with reality. They came out of the houses, passing through narrow streets, hiding themselves from the eyes of the king's men. They wanted to enjoy the benefits from the jagis, yielding thousands of rupees annually by doing nothing in return. Now, what I find when I read this description, I mean, it's almost like they are to, they are in some kind of a illicit relationship. The way they are hiding, the way uh, they sort of hide and slink away, 
uh, and pass through little lanes and by lanes by covering their faces uh, because they want to go somewhere and spend time with each other uh, playing chess. So it becomes, it, it begins to take a certain kind of a, I, mean, I wouldn't say homoerotic, but it, it's definitely more than just social. It's something which has a forbidden illicit quality to it. It's almost like a rendezvous of lovers uh, who are otherwise uh, not allowed uh, to meet, uh, who are otherwise uh, frowned upon, you know, you know, fr they, 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 they look down upon uh, the kind of relationship they have. But they continue to have the relationship, they decide to continue to have the relationship by moving out of the houses and going into uh, the interiors of the kingdom, the margins of the kingdom by playing chess. And now what happens is uh, if you look at this slide from the film, uh, yeah, so this is on the screen now. So this idea of moving out of the kingdom in order to play chess, which is something to do. So you can find, you can see the kingdom is behind them. The, the symbolic towers of power, authority, uh, privilege, uh, political agency are behind them. And they have no place in it anymore. So the two men essentially are moving out of the center, right? And they move into some margins in order to continue playing chess, right? And that tells you something. That is a very good indication, a very symbolic indication of the change, the imminent change in the order of masculinity, which is, you know, is, is going to happen very, very soon. That's why I use the word imminent. So men like these, their brand of masculinity, their kind of masculinity, their kind of gendered mapping is going to come to an end very, very soon. That feudal, hedonistic, uh, you know, very, very, uh, you know, leisurely, luxurious kind of masculinity is about to come to an end and hence they're moving out of the center, right? They're not in the center anymore. They're becoming increasingly marginalized uh, with the change in political situation, okay? So if you, if you read this section now, so from the next day, both the friends would leave their homes before dawn with a small mat under their arms holding a box full of pans. The two friends would make their way across the river Gompe to an old deserted mosque that had been built perhaps by Asaf Udaula. On the way, they would buy tobacco, a chilean, and wine, and they would settle down inside the mosque on their mats, fill up their hookah, and start playing chess. Then they would forget the world. No other words except check and mate would come out of their mouths. No yogi would be so focused in his meditations as these two. When in the afternoon they, they felt hungry, they would go to an eatery and eat something, smoke their hookah for a while, and then restart their play. Sometimes they would forget even to eat. So again, this example of uh, absolute absorption, they are completely absorbed in this unreal game of chess. Uh, and you know, what is interesting is how this becomes more and more forbidden. Now, this used to be a very centered activity, uh, you know, something you know, practiced uh, hegemonically, everyone would play chess. But now with the changing political condition, uh, if two men play chess for the whole day, day after day, that is becoming almost illegal because everything is changing around them. And again, this is a good example of how uh, embodiment changes depending on material political uh, economic conditions. The material political economic conditions are about to change. Right? So this, the shift, there the, the will be very quickly, very soon, a paradigm shift uh, from a feudal order into a capitalist order, from a feudal kind of masculinity to a capitalist kind of masculinity, from a feudal kind of economy to a capitalist kind of economy. Now when this change is happening, the old order, the old worldview, the old rituals should make way to, for the new ones. So the, you know, the game of chess that these men played with each other endlessly at some point in time, which was completely acceptable and perhaps even, you know, uh, you know, glamorized by the value system of the time is now coming to an end. That, that is, is now not such, such a good thing. It's now looked down upon. It's looked as, as an escapist activity, right? And quite literally, they escape from the activity, the center of activity, and they move towards an old mosque, which uh, obviously uh, built by Asaf ud Dawla, uh, an old prophet, uh, you know, and they settle there and play chess. Uh, outside the center. In other words, they quite literally become marginalized men. Literally. I mean, it's, it's not just a symbolic movement. So their kind of masculinity becomes marginalized. So no longer are they allowed to play chess in the center of the kingdom. They have to move out. They have to walk to the margins. And only at the margins will they feel comfortable playing chess. Okay? So, you know, that, that shift is very, very telling. It's very symbolic. It's very, very telling. Right. So, uh, this section, uh, this is one day when they played chess uh, beside the mosque 
and uh, it's 3 in the afternoon. This time, Mirza's position was shaky. Uh, the 4 o'clock bell was ringing as I heard the sound of, of the army's return. Now, the point is that the British army had come in. The British army had come in, entered the kingdom, and you know, nothing happened. There was no resistance, as I said. Uh, no military resistance, nothing. Uh, and the army just walked in, uh, captured the Nawab, and walked back. Right? It's almost like a procession, a peaceful procession, rather than a, a, a battle. There was no battle. And if you watch the film, uh, you, you see the Nawab uh, explicitly uh, instructs the courtiers to tell the army to let go of their weapons. And there's a lovely scene in the film when the weapons are dropped. There are close-ups of rifles, swords being dropped. Uh, you know, so the soldiers are dropping their weapons. Uh, they are letting go of their weapons. In other words, that becomes again a very symbolic, spectacular act of emasculation, right? So uh, the instruction of the Nawab is to let go of your weapons. So letting go of the weapons, which happens in the film, uh, if you watch the film and we play certain sections of the film at the end of this course, where we look at uh, representations of masculinity in uh, media and films and popular culture, where we look at advertisements and films, and that is a section where we you know, play certain slides from the film uh, and, and study it in some detail. But for the purpose of lecture now, what happens in that scene when the soldiers drop their weapons is a very symbolic act of emasculation. There is no political, no military resistance, no manly, quote unquote, manly resistance from the Nawab's soldiers. So the army, the British army, the, the company army just walks in, captures the Nawab and goes away, right? So this section, if you come to this section, if you see this, uh, it's very, very evident. Uh, so there was no commotion uh, in the city and no fighting. Not a drop of blood had been shed. Nowhere the king of a free country would have been captured so quietly without any bloodshed. It wasn't a non-violence that would please the gods. It was a cowardice on which even great cowards have shed tears. The king of a vast country like Awad was being driven away like a prisoner, and the city of Lucknow was sleeping peacefully. This was ne the nether of political downfall. So this is the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the nether of decadence. As I mentioned, it's a very decadent kind of a civilization, a very decadent kind of a culture. And this is a very dramatic description of that decadence. Right? So the, the opposition, the enemy comes in, takes over the king, and nothing happens. There's no blood spilled anywhere. No one cries. Uh, everyone's sleeping peacefully. Uh, and the two men, the two courtiers, they continue to play chess. It almost becomes absurd to a certain extent that they continue to play chess without really being bothered about what's happening at a real political level. Okay? And so this last section of the uh, short story is quite interesting. Uh, so the two men, they start getting more and more hostile uh, with each other because you know, the game of chess begins to become quite competitive. Uh, and they start accusing each other of cheating uh, and then it becomes more personal. So we'll, we'll watch the film. We'll say, play certain slides from the film at the end of the course, but right now, if you read the short story, uh, which is what we're focusing on at the moment, you find that Mir and Mirza, they start insulting one another, right? They start, uh, you know, calling each other names, they start insulting each other's lineage, they start insulting each other's wife. Uh, so Mirza starts insulting Mir's wife, uh, tells or suggests to me that he is being cheated by his wife, which is a very unmanly thing, quote unquote. Uh, to say, to, to, to hear, and the two men uh, then get out from the chessboard and start fighting with each other. So this is what happens. Both the friends drew the swords from the hips. It was an age of chivalry. Everyone was equipped with a sword or a dagger. Both friends were pleasure-loving, but no cowards. They had become devoid of political will to fight for the kings. Why should they die for the king? But they were not deficient in personal courage. Both of them went down fighting and fatally wounded, died, writhing in pain. They, who could not spare a single drop of the fear of tear for the king, died defending their queens on the chessboard. It was getting dark. The pieces still lay on the chessboard. It was as if both the kings sitting on the thrones were shedding tears at the death of their warriors, these warriors. Silence reigned all around. The broken arches, the ruined walls, and the dust-laden pillars of the ruined mosque were watching these corpses and cursing their fate. So it's a very gloomy kind of an ending that a short story offers. So uh, suddenly, uh, there was a flares up, the warrior masculinity returned, and they kill each other, uh, fighting uh, in order to. Interestingly, what the story tells you that they could drop of tear for capture the king and went away. 
uh, they could not bother less about that situation. But they actually do not die, you know, mind defending the queens on the chessboard. So again, the focus, the, uh, the, the, the priority is towards the unreality. The priority is towards the unreal king, the unreal queen on the chessboard. And they don't mind defending it. Uh, you know, to the extent of becoming violent and the extent of being wounded and killing each other. So it's almost like a, uh, it does have a comical quality to it if you read it carefully. So these are men uh, who are courtiers, these are men who carry swords with them. So obviously and presumably they are, uh, you know, some kind of an important uh, courtier, semi warrior uh, kind of landlord, you know, they, they, they belong to that kind of masculinity. But when the British army came in, the company army came in to capture the king, uh, instead of joining forces, and obviously the forces were instructed to let go of their weapons, but instead of being concerned about the king, uh, they were not concerned. They continued to play the game of chess, uh, but they were you know, overly concerned when uh, the, the, the chess pieces uh, entered some kind of complication. So they got up and died defending the queens on the chessboard. And interestingly, uh, the, the last section of the short story tells you that the queens, uh, the, the kings and queens, uh, stood in the chessboard and they were uh, lamenting the loss of the warriors. They're lamenting the death of the warriors. So it became almost like an absurd condition, whereas the king and the queen are not really the king and the queen in the real world anymore. It's an unreal king and the queen who are basically chessboard pieces who are lamenting the death of these two men who died defending their prestige, who died defending their status. And the last image of the short story is that of uh, silence reigning all around the broken arches, the ruined walls, and the dust-laden pillars. So if you look at the description over here on the, on, on the uh, passage, the broken arches, the ruined walls, and the dust-laden pillars are the ruined mass. The word ruined occurs twice, which is indicated by the fact that this is a very decadent kind of an architecture. Right? So the decadence is very, very evident in the architecture. It's something coming to an end, and they were all lamenting and watching these corpses and cursing their fate. So a, a certain kind of error is coming to an end. So what is indicated quite clearly is the fact that this kind of masculinity has come to an end. This kind of a worldview has come to an end. And a new masculinity, a new gendered location, a new gendered worldview will begin now with the arrival of the company, which is more capitalist, more mercenary, more merciless, less pleasure loving, less leisurely, and more productive. Now, We'll end here today because this is the end of the short story. But we'll see towards the end of the course where the component there is a component on um, films and popular culture. We'll look at the ending of the film of Shoti Dry, Shatan Shikilari, and we'll notice the very significant differences uh, between the ending of the film and the ending of the short story. No one dies in the film. But in a very symbolic way, they do die in a worse way in the film. And we'll talk about that in, in great detail as we look at the film. But this is uh, the short story, Shatan Shikilari by, by Munshi Premchan. So hopefully, uh, you, you have an idea of the way gender plays out in a short story, how gendered locations change, how gendered identities change, how they're uh, you know, formulated and reformulated depending on certain material conditions like economy, politics, military conditions, etc. And this is a very, very compelling text, a very complex and compelling text about the location of gender, especially in its relationship with space, agency, embodiment, and performativity. So thank you for listening, and hopefully you will have gained something from this lecture, and I'll see you in the next lecture when we move on to the next text, which is uh, George Orwell's Shooting the Elephant. And before that, we'll also spend some time looking at uh, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. So thank you for listening, and I'll see you again very, very shortly. Thank you.